I'm Matt Brownell. And I'm Van Owens. And I'm Tim Adams. Welcome to Climbing the Mountain, where we dive into the scriptures and discuss themes, connections, and real life application. We're kicking off a series here where we're going to examine the Sermon on the Mount and discuss implications for this teaching for Christians today. Welcome back. We are in the Beatitudes. We've gone through now where we looked at the structure and now we're going line by line each one of the blessings or blessed people or blessed people, however you want to say that. We are now up to those who mourn. Tim, do you want to read us? So, side note, the meaning of the word does not change if you use bless or blessed. <laughs> the whole off my conversation about that. <laughs> well, <laughs> How you hear it, though. <laughs> anyway. All right. Uh, yeah, I can read it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Awesome. Thank you. Why does Jesus say blessed are those who mourn? How can we be blessed, supremely blessed, fortunate, superlatively happy, and mourn at the same time? Yeah, I mean, I think for for me, what I'm thinking about is it has to be what are you mourning about? Hmm. That's that would be the kind of the crux of it. Um, because again, I don't think Jesus is saying that anyone who's mourning is going through a really difficult time is going to be comforted. I just it, that that sort of plain meaning. If you're mourning, you're going to be comforted. Doesn't seem. Mm-hmm. True. It's also not true. It's, it's not, not true. Our experience says it's not true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I yeah. think something with that seems weird. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it seems to me that there's got to be, well, am I, is it, is it the type of mourning? Is it what I'm mourning about? Um, I think it really has to do with weeping over, like mourning over sin and mm-hmm. brokenness, mm-hmm. Um, whether that's my own whether that's the world's, um, because I do think there's a promise that that brokenness will be Interesting. reconciled. So right? mm-hmm. so this, I mean, I think you, you've hit on something pretty important here. We, it reminds me of Acts 2 when it says, you know, when they saw that their sin had crucified Jesus, their Savior, the Messiah, the promised one, they were cut to the heart. Is that the kind of I th- I think so, and and maybe it has some to do with the although this is a little bit different with like the the godly sorrow and worldly sorrow mm-hmm. in um is it First Corinthians, it's in Corinthians. Se- Second, Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians, um, where there it's more about how you're responding to something, but there's a there's a sense of recognizing a a brokenness that's there mm. and and wanting that to be a different way. Yeah. Um, and you I think destroyed something by your sin, whether it's anger, lust, greed, whatever it was. Yeah. And you need, you need help. You, you don't want it to be like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I don't know. I, I, to me, that's like the first step on this. Like I, I'd say that it, there's something in that ballpark, mm. but I'm really curious what you guys think. I love that. Yeah, so I, I I think we are definitely on to something. I do think though it doesn't say he he's probably intentionally unspecific about what you mourn for. And yeah. so I have a hard mm-hmm. time saying like, oh, you know, it must only be mourning for sin. I I, I yeah. kind of ha- I I have a very hard time getting there. Yeah, and that feels like one of those things where we're trying to get an easy. Not that you're do, not that Tim's mm-hmm. doing this, but like, mm-hmm. where if I if I just leave that there, I'm trying to get a nice, easy stock answer I can repeat. Yeah, and that's not really what this lends itself to. Yeah, I I always every time I read one of these, I have to go back to enjoying God's favor are dot 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 those who mourn. Hmm. Um, and I, I I think I probably I think about it in a much uh, kind of in a fairly concrete way, and I don't like mourning. Um, Who does? Well, no, nobody nobody likes it, and 
I also think we don't like to be around mourning. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. right. Like it's definitely not. It's really uncomfortable. Like if someone's in mourning, like you don't know what to say to them. Mm-hmm. You don't know what not. Even more. Even sometimes more importantly, what not to say yeah, to them. Sometimes you shouldn't say anything. You don't know. Do they want a hug? Do they want to be left alone? It's a very like uncomfortable situation because you know in. It's just uncomfortable. And so I don't like it. I don't like being around it. I think this is, again, a thing where God is going, you mourning, but it's something we all experience at Mm -hmm. some point. And if you haven't experienced it, you will. Um, You know, you mourn for things that are lost. You mourn for things that are not as you thought they would be, Um, not you mourn for family members who Mm. you lose. You mourn for relationships lost. Mm -hmm. Um. And I think there's there's a couple things here I, I really like. I think the first is that this creates a space for that, mm-hmm. and this should create a space for mourning in our fellowship. And we don't, you know, I love our fellowship. We we don't totally know how to mourn. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, we don't. We, we're not. Com- we are yeah. unsurprisingly because none of. No, when I said we're all uncomfortable with mourning, the entire room nodded. So yeah, it, <laughs> I'm, t- I'm taking that true. as agreement. Nobody mm-hmm. likes it. And nobody's comfortable around it. I I was thinking like Job, right? When it says he wails and you know mm-hmm. all this, like he's uncontrollably. And then uh, in all this, Job did not sin. Yeah. So like, could you imagine someone like Job in our congregation, like weeping and wailing? We would be like, please, ripping their clothes, and oh my gosh, something's wrong with that guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we would be like, um, please go away. <laughs> Right. But like I, I think I think in a very real way, like we this is us. At least how I view this for me is, I need to mourning is an okay part of the Christian experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like a following Jesus, mourning is a part of it, and it, we need to have space for it in our walk with God, and in our both individual walk with God and in our collective walk with God. And I also think, to go repeat something I said last time, God doesn't... We don't get to God's favor once we stop the mourning. Mm-hmm. Like, I think we can view, oh, you're mourning, well, you're just self pit. you know, you're self-pitying, right? Mm. Get up and do, get up and go. God's going, no, it's okay to mourn. It's okay to be in this state yeah. where you just sit in it. And sometimes you mourn, you mentioned 2 Corinthians, or you, both of you mentioned 2 Corinthians. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the beginning of that, Paul's talking about how he was mourning, he was despairing even of life, yeah. And that what what did that do? It it helped him stop relying on himself and instead trust God, his, and that's where he found true comfort. And so, it, it, sometimes we mourn. We're going through something terrible, like you could be going in a job, like cataclysm, like everything's falling yeah. apart around you. And uh, it can, if we let it, drive us into what is our ultimate joy, which is God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I think what God, what Jesus, I think you're you're right. It, if we let it, um, it can drive us into a great place. And I also think He's saying it's okay when other people are here. These are people you need to engage because He's mm. talking to the disciples, and they're young. Um, you know, probably in our world, anywhere between eleven and like fifteen, maybe. Um, Whoa. Yeah, that's another conversation for another time. Um, it's okay to mourn. Like, there is space for this. And I think that's the thing that for us is a bit revolutionary, is for all of these things, for like being stuck in despair, for mourning, there has to be a space for that mm-hmm. in our individual and collective lives. Mm-hmm. Something, so I'm reading a book about bereavement. Uh, about um just because and reading it because of some personal things that I'm going through with people that I've lost and haven't it's not settled out yet it's not it's still in me the loss is still there but also because I'm so uncomfortable when anybody is mourning mm-hmm. that I and I I feel like there is something lacking in me that I can't that I can't participate in that with people mm. that I have to avoid it and one thing that one snippet from the book that uh, the author says I wish I had 
it at the top of my mind, but it's somewhere down the bottom beneath everything else. <laughs> um, that mourning is the summation of love. Huh. That you, and he, again, he's talking about it in the sense of the death of a loved one, that the, what, what, is what mourning is, is what's left of that love that now has no outlet. And that you have to let it, you have to let it flow through you, however it flows through you. And so I thought about that and I thought, so there is that kind of deep, um, heartfelt mourning for a lost loved one. But confessing my own superficiality and materialism, I can mourn losing anything. I remember once I had I had a fedora, a hat that I loved. I loved that hat. I wore it all the time. And one day I was all befuddled. I had a bunch of stuff, packages or bags or something. And I took my hat off and put it on top of my car. Oh, no. So that I could put every – I don't oh, know no. why I did that, but I took it off and I put away. it on top of the car. And then I drove away. My hat was lost forever. <sighs> and I felt bad. I felt terrible. It was equivalent to mourning. And I, I think that uh, uh, another thing that I'm reading sort of about more about Matthew and about mm -hmm. the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about the progression of these first three of the first few Beatitudes. He talked about how you're poor in spirit. Uh, that poverty of spirit, when you recognize your poverty of spirit, what it produces in you is mourning. Hmm. You mourn that that person who is bankrupt of spirit, and then that makes you meek, which then makes you hunger and thirst for righteousness, hmm. which I thought was kind of an interesting cool. thing to say. Hmm. And I thought, and, and I'm sort of, I'm rounding the bend on this, that I think that if I think of mourning as the um as the the love that's left for something that's lost then if it's for something if i'm mourning over something that i loved but shouldn't have loved hmm. a hat <laughs> <laughs> or or money or a job or something that something that i cling to in sort of an idolatrous way then maybe I need to think about where I place my love. Yeah. And what I need to mourn for is that that better self that God created me to be. Yeah. That part of me that is exactly like God, that is the likeness of God. And when I'm not <gasps> in touch, bless you, <laughs> with Thank that you. self, <laughs> that um, when I'm not in touch with that self, that that's the type of mourning that I need to I need to be yeah. in touch with that so that I can get in touch with the comfort that God offers well, for that. The mourning for things you shouldn't have or you shouldn't. It reminds me. I so I was reading Psalm seventy three a mm -hmm. while ago. It's one of the. I think it's begins the third book. It's a, a Psalm of Asaph, and he it reads almost like the opposite of the Beatitudes. He's looking out at the people that have everything. They mm -hmm. got mel, uh, wealth and they look good and They're no problems. Yeah. And look at them and and uh, <laughs> it, so it, all the things the world values, right? Mm -hmm. And then what happens? He that all shifts after he enters the sanctuary mm -hmm. and he goes into the presence of God. <laughs> And then he gets the right perspective mm -hmm. and that changes him. And, and he realizes uh, those things he's, he shouldn't be mourning for those things. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, let's go on to the meek. We've, we've talked about this a little bit. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the land. Now this one finds its ground in Psalm, another Psalm, Psalm 37 verse 11. It says, but the meek will inherit the land. What does it mean to be meek? And how does that look, especially within the context of that Psalm that Jesus is referencing? Meek has, uh, there's kind of two different, I was looking through definitions uh, and the Hebrew is describing someone who's poor and afflicted while the Greek is kind of the strong yet control, like under control. Hmm. Um, 
And I, I think there could be a very easy self-identity with Israel and with the people listening who are Jews of like, we're the strong, great nation, but we're like subjugated by the Romans. And, and they, they could feel very resentful of that. I mean, I would feel resentful of that. I don't know. I know they were not happy about that. Um, I'm not sure if resentful is quite the right word, but they weren't happy about being meek in this particular way of being subjugated. And I think Jesus is, what I hear here is Jesus is inviting them to think differently. Like he is in so many things here. He's saying, look, no, meekness is good. I'm with the meek. I'm with the people who are subjugated, who theoretically are strong, but are subjugated unfairly. Like, I'm with those people. Hmm. I'm working with you. Just because you got conquered and subjugated by the... I'm using the word subjugated way too much, but I can't think of another one. Sorry if you're an English major. Um, He's still using them. He's still with them. He hasn't forgotten about them. He's still at work within them. It's not a sign of being meek and being under, being controlled is not a sign of losing God's favor. God's still seeing us and God's still working with us. And ultimately we we can, you know, play the game of like, oh, we need to be under the control of God and that's how we're Mm -hmm. meek. And I, and I think there's probably a bit of that. I think what they would have heard was we are the we're under the thumb of the Romans mm-hmm. yeah. in a lot of ways. I I think that's an interesting interesting point to make because um I think there is a doubling too here of of meaning and I think you'd hear one thing and then you you can draw with a lot of things in the Bible you can draw out the spiritual underpinnings um and I think uh what you said about the Hebrew in thir- in Psalm 37 it is this kind of um you know meek uh, poor, humble, afflicted, needy, weak, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And um, so uh, I think it's really interesting to to see a connection here between inheriting the land and attaining the promised blessings, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the ultimate promised land, the new creation reality with God present and no sin, and 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 that being for the meek these poor, humble, afflicted, needy, weak people. Um, and I, I think what I see in Psalm 37, there's one uh, part of where I, um, I'm going to read, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart, uh, verse four. And I think um, sometimes I've, I've heard people even pray that and think, I'm, you know, that means uh, I'm going to get wealth now. I'm going to get this thing I wanted. I want this new job. Thanks God. I'm delighting in you the most. No, <laughs> that's not what that means. Yeah. Uh, delighting in, in the Lord. If you're, if you're delighting in him above all things, you get him. Right. And, and, and so, true desire and that is the, heart. yes. <laughs> and so it doesn't matter if you're subjugated by the Romans or mm-hmm. you're whatever. And I think there's also a, um, something about this that gets to the desire of our heart and, mm-hmm. and who we really put on the throne of our heart, right? That should mm-hmm. be God, not ourselves. Yep. And so I think there's that quality, right? In our hearts, what do we desire the most? If it's something besides God, that's going to be a crushing master mm-hmm. that will destroy us. Mm-hmm. And God's the only one who will really let us... Um, set us free in a sense. And, and, and I also love in Psalm 37, it talks about how he'll make our righteousness shine like the dawn. Mm-hmm. Um, he's going to redeem us and um, we'll gain what's most valuable, him. Yeah. Can, I, can I make one more point about this? Um, I, I think there it says, um, when it says they will inherit the earth, like there's a trust and reliance on God in, in terms of the inheritance, like a trust yeah. of like, hey, if you... If you bring yourself down here, mm-hmm. I will give you this. Mm-hmm. But you actually have to bring yourself down. Yeah, mm-hmm. you can't try mm-hmm. to force your way to this. And I think that's. I think that would have read in a very comforting way to a people who are under the thumb of the Romans of like, mm-hmm. hey, I'm, I'm. If you trust me and you stay with me, you're gonna do this. We're gonna do this. But you gotta come down. Mm-hmm. You yeah. gotta put yourself. Lower yourself. 
Mm -hmm. and trust me. But also, like, the zealots wouldn't have liked that. No. You know? A zealot would have been like, (laughs) Like, excuse me? Because this is totally different. And this Mm -hmm. is, I think, foreshadowing the... What he talks about of not resisting an evil person mm-hmm. and loving your enemies, mm-hmm. like yeah. Yeah. a lot of that stuff. You know, there's a there's a different way to inherit the land yeah. than yeah. what you're thinking and what you're waiting for. Right. Well, and, and yeah. not to get too deep into because again, I could talk about all of these in podcasts. But the zealots kind of said, okay, if we do this, if we're ze- if we're zealous enough about what we're doing, God will overthrow the Romans mm-hmm. for us. You know, we and, just don't have enough faith. We need to do it. Like, well, is that where you kind of? Uh, n- not or in if, the not in the we, Western if Christian we do sense. It, then God will, you know, honor. God, like- God I think, uh, not wanting to like project things on them. It's it was almost like if we resist strongly enough, the Romans, and if we, and, and in their mind, kill enough Romans, God will see our zeal and deliver us from them. Mm. Mm. Um, not if not like, hey, we just need more faith, but like if we can resist strongly enough. So I. But I, I think Tim's Tim was so right. Like, not this doesn't land. Everyone doesn't go. Ah, yes. God goes. No, I'm inviting you, but you got to come down. Mm-hmm. You got to be meek. I I meek is a meek is a rough word, man. <laughs> <laughs> it just it just is. Yeah. I mean, if if you walked into the room, if 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 anybody who walked into a room, and the response was, hey, Van, you're looking really meek today. <laughs> right. <laughs> huh? I'm not going to feel good about that. No. I'm going to feel some kind of way, but I'm not going to feel good about that. And this is somebody, and I know what the passage says. I know the passage says, blessed are the meek. But if somebody calls me meek, I'm going to feel affronted mm. in some way. And I think it's just it's a it's a rough concept, and I don't know if it's just a rough concept for men or if it's a rough concept for um, Western thinking people, and not so much for Eastern thinking people. That, I don't know how to answer that because I don't I'm know how to Western. answer that. But what the thing that has one of the things that helps me with it is to think of the opposite uh-huh. of meekness, which to me is like bravado. Which is like somebody who wants, who looks and acts like they have it together. You know, the 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 day of the football game when the players are running out of the tunnel, that's bravado, right? They're they're jumping up and down, they're they're pumping their fists, they're screaming, they're yelling, they're trying to get up for the very physical huh. thing that they're about to do. It's bravado, and we all recognize what it is, and we all understand that in a real sense, it is superficial and a little fake, that they're acting in such a way. And yet, we I know for me, I often try to portray that in how I carry myself, in my comportment. My comportment is more bravado and i do that to cover up and conceal my insecurities because what i grew up believing is that your insecurities are something that people will use against you mm. so you need to cover them up you need to you need to put them behind you. You need to put them deep down inside so somebody doesn't take advantage of you. And I think what the passage is saying is no no no, no the opposite is true. Mm-hmm. Everything that you feel that you feel that you feel confident about, if you feel confident about something, then that's the thing that you should cover up with your meekness. That's the thing that you should so if you feel like for instance, I feel like I'm a pretty good speaker. Mm. I'd agree. I yeah. feel like I'm I feel like I'm pretty good at that. So that's something that I should not try to I should not try to use my ability to speak to cover up my insecurities. I should think of it in a meek way and say, well, I'll just speak when I'm called upon. I'm not going to call the minister and ask him if I can do the communion service every week mm. because I'm such a good speaker. I'll just I'll be meek about it. I'll wait, and if he asks me, I'll say yes. But I, I but it, it, and that's just maybe a poor example. But 
meekness is 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 something that we use to uh, cover the things that we feel like we're strong in, the things that edit. And what it produces for us is we inherit the earth. And here's the thing about inheritance. You, it, it, it's a, it gives you security, right? Mm-hmm. Somebody who's going to inherit wealth does not worry about what am I going to do with my life. Mm-hmm. They just do with their life what they feel called to do. Mm-hmm you know, good or bad, but they, they can do with their life. They have the freedom to do what they're called to do. And I think that one of the things that Jesus is saying here is that if you're meek, then you have the freedom to be who you really are, which is who you are in Christ, who you are in the sight of God. Hmm. I don't know if this has a connection or not, but I started thinking about the promised land and the Israelites when they crossed over. And um, there was an, a, a, a sense that, okay, this is their inheritance, but it, hey, they waited like over 400 years for it. And it was all in God's timing because mm-hmm. the sin of the the people had not reached its, its you know, whatever. Anyway, they, they finally get there and uh, they don't go in because they're looking at what can we do? Oh, these people are too big. Oh, no, no, no. And it's really just, it's God. And mm-hmm. so like, okay, well, you guys aren't going to get it. So ne- next generation, 40 years later, um, let's go in and and how does, God does it, you know, mm-hmm. but Jericho is like a scene of, they're not doing anything. They're just following, they're, okay, God, you're mm-hmm. in charge. You, you're going to do it. And uh, we're going to march around a city mm-hmm. and blow some, what's going on? Okay, yeah. we'll do it. And, you know, of course, the walls fall down. And, and anyway, you, the rest is history. But the, the, the quality of I'm not in charge, mm-hmm. God is in charge. This yeah. is for his glory. His, this is his thing. And um, I submit. Mm. I trust yeah. And I, I, you know, I think it's one of those, I, when I talk to him, I talk to my brother a lot and I talk, I tell him about there's, there's so many thin lines in, uh, the, in devotion to Christ. There's a thin line, I think, between meekness and false humility. There's a thin mm-hmm. line between bravado and confidence there's a thin line between all of these things mm. and you know we always end up saying but how do we how do we negotiate the thin lines and that's where our relationship with god and our relationship with each other comes in it's almost like we can't navigate the we can't navigate the thin lines without lots of sets of eyes yeah. and ears mm-hmm. So I'm I'm reminded my wife, um, who is definitely more of an absolute thinker than I am. Like she like my wife is the consummate rule follower. Mm-hmm. She likes having <laughs> rules. She likes having lots of rules. Mm-hmm. The more rules she has for things, she she feels lots of comfort in concrete rules. And a lot of the time we'll talk about spiritual things and she'll go, Where's the line? Where's the line? Where's the line? And I'm like I don't know. <laughs> like, the very honest right. answer is, I don't know where the line is. Mm-hmm. And like Van mentioned, there's there's a thin, and it's not just thin; it's a pretty blurry line between a lot of these things. Mm-hmm. And you know, Jesus, and we're we're trying to navigate that. Mm-hmm. And so I think if you're listening, as we bring this in for a landing, yeah, we've crossed the time. Line. Yeah, we've crossed the line. <laughs> the less. <laughs> Less blurry and much more visible and thicker line of time. Um, But like (laughs) we need help and we need like there are there's not always the line. We don't always know where the line is and that's okay. And we have to get comfortable living in a in a way where we're trying honestly to do our best and Mm -hmm. we're open to feedback and we're trying to honor Jesus. And if we don't do it right. We'll figure it out next time. Awesome. Well, this has been great. Let's uh, come back next time where we can get into hunger, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I hope uh, you'll join us again and, and join that feast. Mm-hmm.